I'm very happy uh, for people uh, to have invited, invited me. Uh, James Jenkins and the Her uh, Walpole Island Heritage Center. Uh, I give my thanks to for, for inviting me here. I have to really change my uh, title of my paper because of Keith Sopola and being on the stage, straight stage with him, he's inspired me. So uh, my my title is should be uh, we are, from Tecumseh's speech at Amherstburg. We are determined to defend our lands and our fry bread. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Tecumseh and British Imperial and Canadian myths of pro protection and citizenship. On September the 18th, now more than 200 years ago, Tecumseh spoke at the First Nations Council House at present-day Amherstburg, overlooking the Detroit River. He held a, a belt, wampum belt of many colors that was arranged to tell the story of his people to General Proctor, representing the British Imperial government. Tecumseh went on to state that if the British wished to withdraw from this place, then they should leave behind their arms and ammunition for the indigenous warriors to use to fight the Americans. Tecumseh finished his speech by giving his vision. Quote, our lives are in the hands of the great spirit. We are determined to defend our lands. And if it is, is, if, and if it is his will, we wish to leave our bones on them, Unquote. However, the British Imperial forces retreated. They did not fight to also protect First Nations lands. The next battle was fought north of the Thames River and Tecumseh, as well as many other First Nation warriors, died defending their lands. However, their stories did not die with them. Tecumseh is buried on these unceded indigenous lands and a memorial is still standing overlooking the St. Clair River today. The vision of Tecumseh lives now, as it did in 1813, as well as many hundreds of years before, especially in this place. It is appropriate that his vision be, be, re, be uh, rekindled, where it was always present. It's important to, that his vision be rekindled, where it was always present. Right? This vision of defending First Nations lands was not born with Tecumseh. His vision has come to represent indigenous sovereignty over the past 200 years. This vision is contradicted by the existence of the British Empire and the Canadian nation state. It is no wonder then that Tecumseh is not remembered through memorials in Canadian places, whereas Isaac Brock is recognized by our current prime minister as a great builder of empire. At least since, if not well before, the Royal Proclamation of 1763, this vision was guided by the Covenant Chain of Summer, the True Rule Wampum, as well as the Niagara Treaty of 1764. It formed an integral part of the relationship between indigenous nations and the British Imperial Empire. The latter sought to share this vision by espousing the myths of protection and citizenship in the form of British Imperial trusteeship. Since 1763, that protection has not been at all forthcoming. Instead, the British Imperial and then the Canadian government governments failed to provide any to provide any military or other protection and proceeded using the mechanism in the Royal Proclamation of 1763, contrary to the 1764 Niagara Treaty, as other legislation, including the Indian Act, acts to take First Nations lands by surrender or illegally by other means. This fact has been documented by documented by research within the Walpole Island Territory over the past quarter of a century. We've researched the history of the Cajuan Territory, more than 50 land, uh, stories about land, and they all bear the same uh, 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 story. They're all basically a, the same story that of resistance by the uh, Walpole Island First Nation over the, the um, uh, of, over the Canadian and uh, and the British imperial governments, not being citizens of the British Empire or the Canadian empires, First Nations citizens remain sovereign peoples in their own territories and homelands. Imperial or Canadian citizenship was never offered to First Nations citizens until 1961. 
1961. And the myth of British imperial citizenship was concocted as mere propaganda of these empires. This situation was writ large in the de facto control of the Indian Act, 1876, and its successors to this day. We still have the Indian Act, but we're still here. We're still here. We've resisted the Indian Act. Not being citizens, First Nations people had virtually little or no protection against these empires taking away their territories or homelands. The situation, the situation changed here on Walpole Island in 1965 when Chief Burton Jacobs uh, um, uh, and the citizens of Walpole Island brought in their own form of self-government and removed the Indian agent. That was a landmark event in the vision of Tecumseh. Lands were taken during and after the American Revolution, Treaty of Paris of 17, 1783, the Vie Treaty of 1790, the taking of the Chanel Cart Reserve and the St. Anne Treaty of 1796, the British Imperial Civil War of 1812-14, the Treaty of Ghent which followed it in 1815, and the subsequent survey of the international boundary. The British Empire and then the Canadian Empire allowed trespasses on First Nations lands in spite of the Indian Protection, Protection Acts of 1839 and after, litigation showing that this was, quote, no place for fairness. Thereafter, the process continued under the Indian Act and down to 1965 when Walpole Island achieved its own form of self-government. Even First Nations children and dogs were not protected under these imperial regimes. Children were placed in residential schools and, abu and abused horrifically, and its dogs were shot. It is fitting that we honor the memory of Tecumseh's vision in this place. The Kajawan, meaning in English, the place where the waters divide, First Nations have occupied, used these islands and other lands since time immemorial. The First Nation has never relinquished, ceded, ceded surrendered, or through a treaty or any other agreement with the Crown, any of the lands or parts thereof, or the waters thereof, or their indigenous title or rights to these islands and other lands. The citizens, citizens of the Walpole Island First Nations use their territory for many purposes, including the sur service as well as the subservice resources. It is truly the soul of Indian territory. The Casuan treaties have a long history, which is recorded in Walpole Belts, oral traditions, and in the record, written records of Europeans. The two Roman Wampum and the Covenant Chain represented to the, to the relationship between the English imperial government and the indigenous nation, mainly peace, respect, and trust. The primary consideration of this, as well as other treaties then and now, included sovereignty, land, indigenous title and land rights, and indigenous trade within their country. These promises were not in, in, inconsequential at a time when the British imperial uh, foothold on the North American continent was at, was at best precarious. Sir William Johnson, the first Superintendent General of Indian Affairs, passed away in 1774, 10 years after the Treaty of Niagara uh, uh, was agreed upon. After that, things fell apart. The treaties of, of uh, Detroit, uh, Niagara were lost and then forgotten by the Indian Department by the 1890s. The treaty in initiatives of the indigenous people based on their sovereignty were replaced by later British and Imperial Canadian policy directed at, directed at uh, indigenous peoples. Such policy is multi-dimensional and multifaceted, as J.W. Sell noted more than 50 years ago, quote, as being something rather like less fixed something rather more historical, unquote. As a result, it is clearly that at any moment in time, quote, there is not so much policy as policy formation, as unsettled and changing set of responses by government to the continual interaction among men and women, forces, ideas, and institutions, unquote. And of course, that, that included resistance by First Nations uh, at, at the local level. Canadian Indigenous policy must also be viewed from the perspective of First Nations citizens and their governments. It must not be forgotten that non-Indigenous people and their gov governmental institutions have been visitors to, in to Indigenous homelands. Protection 
of First Nations homelands are fun, are is is fun, fundamental. On May the nineteenth, uh, seventeen ninety. The Mekipehi Treaty of Purchase, also known as Treaty 2, was entered into by the Crown and the ancestors of the Walpole Island First Nation. It's clear that from the geographic description that the waters and the lands and the islands and other lands were not included or were referred to in that treaty. In fact, at that council meeting or at any other or at another at about that time, the Crown's representative, Alexander McKee, promised the Walpole Island First Nation that certain lands within their territory, including the islands and Lake Sinclair and, else, and elsewhere, would be especially protected by the Crown as ancient places of fire, and the Walpole Island First Nation would never have to surrender or relinquish rel 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 these lands, these islands. The lands were unceded and part of the Walpole Island territory. That was to be the ex for the exclusive use of the Walpole Island First Nations. The understanding of the citizens of Walpole Island First Nation was that their indigenous title and rights would continue within the geographic area covered by the treaty. And of course, the First Nation is also uh, continuing their court case begun in the year 2000 about the uh, waters in, in the Great Lakes. With the coming of the War of 1812-14, once again, the area was the theater of high diplomatic and military strategy for all the nations, indigenous and European, who participated in it. One of the most important battles of the war was fought in the Waffle Island Territory. Deserted during the war and thereafter, the British imperial government forgot the indigenous nations, their allies in times of peace as well as in times of war for almost 200 years. It became a time of catastrophe, of tragedy, and of reserves and borders. After the Civil War in 1815, the Treaty of Ghent was signed to restore relations in North America between the United States and Great Britain. The indigenous nations were not party of the treaty and never ex accepted it or its implications for them. The result was that a boundary never agreed upon by the Free Three Fires Confederacy split the Casuan territory. The British Empire tried to take away sovereignty and jurisdiction from the First Nations during the survey. A commission was appointed by both governments, the uh, American and the British Imperial Government, to define the international boundary from the St. Lawrence River through the Great Lakes to Lake Superior. This was done without any consultation with the First Nations. The survey of that boundary was specifically defined in the Commissioner's Report of June 18, 1817 signed by their agents five years later. However, it was never ratified by the executive authority of either government thereafter. This was something that is a story uh, uh, that I learned when I was doing research here on the island. The elders told me, go out and find any written document that, that proves that the boundary was through the Great Lakes was signed by executive authority of the American and British Imperial government governments. I looked. Nobody has ever looked. I looked. There isn't any uh, uh, um, uh, signing of the executive authority of the international boundary, only through the Great Lakes. The boundary was signed by executive authority before the Great Lakes and out west, but not through the Great Lakes. Amazing. By this imperm impermanent settlement, as I would like to call it, the international boundary was placed through Lake St. Clair and the St. Clair River, where this imaginary line is presently seen to be located. However, it did not disturb, nor did it constitute a relinquishment or surrender of the Indian Territory, or in any interest therein. To illustrate this point, this policy led to the establishment, without the consent or the consultation of the First Nations by the Canadian or the American governments, of an international boundary, which arbitrarily altered earlier treaty arrangements. This is an amazing uh, statement of a factual nature. Most importantly, the Walpole Island First Nation lost through this means effective possession of part of its territory. For example, across the river, Arsons and Dickinson's Island. The, this fundamental injustice remains outstanding today. 
relocation and ex attempted ex extinguishment of indigenous title and reserve lands in Upper Canada continued after the War of 1812-14. Gradually, a full-blown British imperial policy of settlement and civilization was established by the 1920s, late 1920s, late 1820s. Many more requests came from land surrenders from the British Crown under the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Next Monday, we're celebrating the 250th anniversary of the of the Royal Proclamation of 1763. What, what, despite that signing, there were countless illegal uh, 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 things done to First Nations land. land. Relocation and attempted extinguishment of indigenous title and reserve lands uh, uh, continued, despite the Royal Proclamation. Beginning in the 1820s, with increasing British immigration and agricultural settlement by white settlers on a large scale began. More lands were needed by the white immigrants, particularly from Great Britain and the United States. Requests came for more land surrenders. In the late 1820s and 30s, under Governors Darling, Coburn, and then Sir Francis Bond Head, the British Imperial Government embarked on this policy of civilization in Upper Canada. And it was already deemed a success by British imperial officials in Lower Canada, where it had been implemented following the War of 1812-14. The British imperial civilization, later amalgamation policy, was crucial to the colonization of indigenous peoples in Canada and elsewhere in the empire. It was also key to their continued rationale to resist this incursion on their sovereignty. By the mid-19th century, the British Imperial Government was formally re reviewing its solemn, solemn promise, promises of, about land rights to indigenous peoples and its policy commitments to uphold these promises. One, su one such commentator on British Imperial on policy was Herman Merivale, who was the most important civil servant at the colonial office between eight and the mid-19th century, a period of enormous transitions. Barry Revelle is important because he understood, at least initially, the predicament of indigenous peoples and fought for a policy that would respect their way of life while at the same time benefit the interests of the British. They all, nevertheless, he also later became the enemy of First Nations and the Métis Nation in particular. Maryville did his utmost in the late 1840s and 50s to discredit my great-great-great-grandfather William Kennedy, a Métis, and Kennedy's nephew, Alexander Kennedy, his mister, at the colonial office because they called attention to the legal fact that the Hudson's Bay Company a license ex uh, monopoly expired in 1692, but yet the, the British government and the company was was propounding this bit of propaganda, so just like it did in terms of the uh, the Royal Proclamation. But when Maryville became a, a member of the Colonial Office, he he didn't uphold uh, like most British imperial administrators. He did not uphold this uh, this uh, promise, even though he, he knew it was wrong. Much of Canada's indigenous policy has been viewed one-dimensionally as primarily a symbol of, as a form of directed cultural change. This has been seen as originating in the 19th century and culminating in the federal government's white paper of 1969. The historical myth has been created that things were not falling apart, but thought somehow they were getting better. This is, a, this is the federal government's story, and it's wrong. Wrong. And we have to do things to dismiss that myth, and we have to bring them about our, uh, tell our own stories. The fact is that, as always, there has been indigenous resistance here and elsewhere. These are the stories about Tecumseh's vision and the need to protect the land. The veracity of this historical myth is difficult to explain in the light of events since 1815 including the summer of 1990 in Oka, Ipper Wash in 1995, and elsewhere in Indian country since that time. In conclusion, the British Imperial Government did not allow First Nations citizens to practice dual citizenship since British Imperial citizenship never existed. And it certainly didn't exist for First Nations citizens. 
the British Imperial and the Canadian Citizenship Act of, in 1947, did not recognize First Nations citizens of Canada until 1961, when the first Canadian Bill of Rights came into being. Why should these imperial governments provide protection to human beings who, were, who, were, who lived on the land before they came? And why did they not regard as citizens, these, these people as citizens, citizens, but rather as aliens? The answer is clear. They did not. That's the fact. They didn't. Instead, the alien imperial governments invoked the myth of protection, which tried to hide the fact that First Nation citizens had no rights as citizens. Thus, they had no protection for their, for their identities, for their lands. That's the fact. These governments could and did take their lands and their children, such as at the residential schools. There are memorials here in Walpole Island about the Tecumseh, and the children who went to residential school here. And the vision of Tecumseh lives on as a gift from the Creator. We are determined to defend our lands. Thank you.